Good evening and welcome to this Casa and Gana Short webinar on the nature of threats from an unstable Pakistan. Joining me in this webinar are Brigadier Arun Saigal and General Gautam Murthy. Sir, at the outset, welcome to this webinar on Pakistan. And, you. Uh, you know, I would like to tell all viewers that unfortunately, General uh, Bhatia will not be able to join us because he's not too well. Right. Having said that, why are we doing this webinar at all on uh, unstable Pakistan? The common thinking is that an unstable Pakistan cannot be a threat, but it is a threat. And that is why we are discussing it. And it is a threat in the, you know, especially with our elections coming up and in the post-election scenario, a lot of things can happen. But then let me give a cap on recap on what Pakistan is at this point of time. Look, at everyone in India is an expert on Pakistan, and he's got his own views about Pakistan and what we should how we should handle Pakistan. Right? Uh, I'll grant everyone that. But where is Pakistan today? Pakistan is in a multiple crisis. There's a political crisis, right? Where elected chief ministers are being abducted. There's a diplomatic crisis. Pakistan doesn't know how to handle China or America or the West uh, or the West Asian uh, countries. There's an economic crisis so far. IMF has not given their, you know, go ahead for the standby arrangement. It's stuck. And if you see the Pakistan media and the, their people, it's not going to, they're not likely to get it in a hurry. Right. There's a security issue. Every second day you find TTP bumping off the security people as also BLA major attacks. And along with this, there are moments like Pashtun Tahfuz uh, movement and, uh, you know, Baloch movement, which non-violent movements, right? Uh, if they join up with any of the other movements, the whole thing can go up like a tender box, right? Then all borders are alive. They, they don't have one peaceful border. They don't have a peaceful border with India. They don't have a peaceful border with Afghanistan. And with Iran also, that border is contentious, right? What happens tomorrow in Pakistan is not known to any Pakistani, including the chief of army staff, right? We don't know. Every day is a new day in Pakistan. And it appears to most that Pakistan is living day by day. But in the midst of all this, it doesn't matter what pa is Pakistan going through. Their anti-India rhetoric and thinking is their mainstay, and especially of the army. The army still considers itself the defender of the faith and the defender of the ideological frontiers of Islam. Right? It is just not, you know, their uh, normal borders. Uh, in their thinking, Kashmir must be won, and that is why you see constant attacks in Jammu region, which we saw recently. And in the run-up to the election, we have not seen a major attack, but it, I will not put it out of bounds. And then there is a role they will pay, play in the post-election scenario. How they will come up is a question mark, which we need to discuss, I'm sure. Okay. And in their opinion, this is their thinking, you know, this is a constant in the Pakistani thinking, is that Hindus are not good fighters, right? Revenge against India must be taken at any cost. There's no doubt. They are adept at playing off China and Pakistan against each other. And, you know, I, I heard a commentator saying yesterday, Idhar ka topi udar, udar ka topi idhar. And this is a Pakistani commentator. They're very adept at it. Right. The military businesses of the Pakistan army gives them, you know, economic clout and political clout. And this in turn, put together, gives them a sort of international clout. Uh, despite what their economic condition is, their defense budget grows by about anything between 6 to 14 percent every year, right? And their arms and ammunition and everything are in pretty good nick. 
In fact, they're expanding their Navy. They're, they're, these days, a lot of their issues regarding economics has have been you know mitigated to a large extent because they are on a spree to sell ammunition to Ukraine and now to Bangladesh. So this is the Pakistan we are talking of. On one hand, economically defunct, politically in uh, mired in problems, internal security. Externally, there is something else. And that external force is all directed towards India. And in this condition, I request uh, first General Gautam Murthy, followed by Brigadier Arun Sahagal, to say what are the nature of threats which we can expect from an unstable Pakistan. Uh, General Gautam Murthy, sir, all yours. Uh, thank you, General Shankar. Good evening and Jai Hind to uh, you, Brigadier Arun Sahagal, my former boss, and to your viewers. Uh, thank you very much for this excellent introduction, General Shankar. You very clearly mentioned an unstable Pakistan uh, is not in India's interest as it poses many significant threats to India uh, in various dimensions. You see, what uh, we need to understand is that after the vir virtual abrogation of Article 370 and 35A of the Constitution by the government, which was ratified by the Parliament in on 5th of August 2019, and then there's been the subsequent detailed and comprehensive unanimous judgment by the Supreme Court of India. Uh, both these have taken the wind out of the sails of uh, Pakistan. Now that elections have been announced to be held uh, this month, the issue of abrogation isn't even coming up in the campaigning. That is not an issue. The only sticking point for the major political parties at the hustings is the restoration of statehood. Now, this restoration of statehood in any case has been assured by the government of India. It's only a question of when. Thus, the main bone of contention between our two countries appears to be a settled matter, albeit from India's side. Pakistan has yet to recognize this de facto as well as de jure reality, having painted itself into a corner by unilaterally breaking off our diplomatic relations with India as soon as the parliament resolution of 5th uh, August 2019 was passed. So Pakistan is yet to reconcile with this. And according to them, Kashmir is still a disputed matter. Now, we all know that back channel talks between the two countries have not yielded much, but there is at least one positive result that we can see. You know, one is looking at some positivity that the ceasefire is holding despite minor violations now and then. In fact, just this morning, uh, you would have uh, read that a BSF Jawan was injured in a ceasefire violation by Pakistan in the Jammu sector. Unfortunately, infiltration continues unabated south of the Pir Punjal. My more uh, knowledgeable colleague and my uh, senior over here, Brigade Saigal, will be able to dilate more upon it during our discussion. I'll simply speak on what could be the triggers to heighten violence and how could this manifest itself? What are the threats that India can expect from this unstable Pakistan? The instability has been brought out brilliantly by General Shankar, so I will not speak about that. See, Pakistan arrived at the conclusion that it could not match India by conventional means. Therefore, it turned into an asymmetric strategy, which we all know General Ziaul Haq enunciated long ago to bleed India by a thousand cuts. So they've been supporting anti-militant, anti-India militant groups, such as the lashkar e taiba and the jaish e Mohammed, both of whom are proscribed terrorist organizations by the United Nations. Operating behind a veil of plausible deniability, they've always used that. Pakistan has been using Kashmiri insurgent groups as a strategic extension of their own security forces and as a force multiplier. Now, you would recollect what uh, the foreign, then Foreign Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton had to say, that you cannot 
raise snakes in your backyard and not have them expect to bite you. So Pakistan today, and not just today, for the last 20 years, has been facing a huge backlash in terrorism. The whole society has been polarized, and terrorism has come home, and it's biting it on a regular basis. Now, we are not looking at what is happening to them. I mean, they may stew in their own juices, which is what they have done to themselves. But India has faced a daunting challenge of formulating an effective counter-terrorism strategy while remaining under the nuclear threshold. Frustrated over our inability to deter Pakistan from supporting military groups inside, uh, militant groups, sorry, from inside India, and smarting from the stalemate of Op Prakram, India has devised its own assertive so-called Cold War doctrine which entails limited advances inside Pakistan, rapidly mobilizing our infantry and armored formations before the defensive positions can also be occupied. Although many people scoff at this Cold Star doctrine, it may be initiated following insurgent attacks on Indian territory that are believed to be supported by Pakistan. Also, please, I'd like to take your viewers' minds back to the surgical strikes carried out by India in POK and the airstrikes on Jabbar top, popularly known as Balakot. India has many options that can be used, but we'll not get into that right now. We'll speak about terrorism and proxy war. I've already mentioned about it. Historically, they will continue to target India by all means possible. Besides trying to disrupt the elections in JNK, these groups could use sympathizers within India and carry out terrorist attacks in cities and towns in India's hinterland. We need to be wary about that. Cross-border violence, unrest in Pakistan often results in heightened tensions along the line of control and this could lead to ceasefire violations and cross-LOC skirmishes. We need to be wary about that. The nuclear threat. Now, Pakistan's nuclear arsenal is a major concern to India. And political instability raises fears of these weapons and the possibility of them falling into the hands of non-state actors. This inherent danger has not only been pointed out by us, by, by the Americans as well. Brigadier Segal can tell you more about that. And Pakistan counters this by saying they've established a robust set of measures to assure the security of its nuclear weapons, nobody need be worried about it, and so on and so forth. They, these basically, they have copied certain U.S. practices on procedures, technologies, physical security, personal reliability programs, deception, secrecy. Now, these measures provides the Pakistan armies that they have the strategic plans division, which actually handles the nuclear weapons. Uh, they give them a high degree of confidence in the safety and security of the nuclear weapons. Uh, although they, the Pakistan army is very, very confident about it, that this could not fall into wrong hands. But nevertheless, that we, we see the cleavage within the army, although General Munir has been pushing out and has sent out a number of people who, who he has felt is batting for the other side. But the danger exists and cannot be wished away by our planners. This has to be factored in when we are looking at the nature of threats from an unstable Pakistan. Now, apart from the nuclear factor, there's another important factor. You see, as India's economy develops and moves in an upwards trajectory, Pakistan's economy, thanks to its own shenanigans, is on a downward trajectory, relying on loans and bailouts. Now, the latest tranche, as General Shankar has pointed out, is actually hanging by a thread. Pakistan is quiet, one of the reasons for that. This has resulted in India continuing to build up its capacities and capabilities. We are countering not just Pakistan, but also China, who we regard as our main adversary today. India's strategic relationship with the US and strengthening of this relationship, which has Bipartisan support in the United States has caused a deep concern to Pakistan. You know, on 17 December 2023, a few months ago at the United Nations Security Council, Pakistan warned India of a conflict. They've actually said it. 
due to a conventional imbalance. And Pakistan's envoy to the United Nations has said, I am quoting now, I'm just reading out exactly what he said. Many destabilizing developments are evident in South Asia, where one state's military spending vastly outnumbers that of all others. This conventional imbalance can also lead to an outbreak of conflict between nuclear armed states due to the inherent danger of escalation. Close my inverted commas. Now, if this is the way Pakistan is looking at our buildup and it continues to be unstable, and if India quickly follows up on any uh, Pakistan supported military attack on Indian soil, could this escalate into an all out nuclear exchange? It is a possibility that has been met with great concern by many analysts. We have discussed it. And because on our deterrence stability, which this uh, stability, instability uh, factor that has been discussed many a time and written about, there is this uh, element that could quickly come in and destroy everything and the balance that we have sought to achieve. The other issue uh, is a couple of uh, civilian issues. One is the refugee crisis. Severe instability and the deleterious effects of climate change are leading to a food crisis in Pakistan. Uh, this could trigger, we have spoken at length on this, this could trigger, trigger a refugee influx into India, particularly in border states like Punjab and Rajasthan. And often I wonder how would India respond if hordes of desperate unarmed civilians are trying to overwhelm their own rangers and by their sheer numbers and pressing onto our border fence. What will we actually do? How would we able to be handling it? This economic stability coupled with uh, climate change uh, can disrupt uh, everything and the balance that we have so far achieved. Uh, one point, of course, is also on when we are looking at threats is uh, cyber wars, which I've already spoken about, uh, sorry, proxy wars and cyber attacks. There is every likelihood of cyber attacks from Pakistan agencies on Indian utilities and facilities. We cannot discount it. Last but not least, I would say is uh, Collusivity with China. In fact, if uh, your viewers would recollect General Shankar, we've had a whole uh, webinar on this in which we have said that Pakistan is at best a tool for in the Chinese grand strategy of becoming a world superpower by 2050. The dependence in perpetuity on China by way of land, unpayable loans, infrastructure development, industry, Chinese weaponry and spares has made Pakistan totally subservient and beholden to China. Uh, a threat from uh, uh, the relationship sorry, between China and Pakistan is for Pakistan, China is a high value guarantor of security for India. And for China, Pakistan is a low cost secondary deterrent to India. This was said by no other than Mr. Hussein Akani, who was in the US as we all know. So a threat from Pakistan along the IC or on the IB in collusion with China cannot be ruled out. And these to my mind uh, cover the gamut of threats to India from an unstable Pakistan as I see it. Thank you, General Shankar, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, you outlined the threats from uh, Pakistan detail. You spoke of the asymmetric threats which we will constantly face due to a polarized society, uh, which will continue. In fact, I won't say the polarized society with the army, uh, with the part of the asymmetric threats will always pose a nuclear threat to us. We need to expect cross-border violence. Uh, in the short term, uh, you outlined that there will be disruption in JNK elections, or likely to be. And the larger issue I feel is that the problem, how Pakistan will interfere in the post-election scenario, depending on you know the kind of uh, the government which comes out.
Right. As far as the nuclear uh, weapons are concerned, it's always a matter of uh, great concern for everyone, not only for India, but for all in all over the world, that it should not fall into the wrong hands. Notwithstanding the fact that the Pakistan army generals are quite confident it will not go out. They're confident it will not go out because they derive power from that. Right. But Pakistan is, you know, anyone's baby in this uh, kind of a story. Uh, and and like you said, uh, in case of uh, economic collapse or some kind of a problem which happens there, uh, we could expect a huge refugee crisis. And this could be also triggered by their problems due to climate change, especially since they are dependent only on one river, Indus. Uh, and if Indus goes dry, and there are already indications because the Indus waters don't reach Karachi fully, uh, then you are looking at a major issue, uh, food security issue within Pakistan. And other than that, yes, you said we will, we should expect cyber attacks and you know proxy attacks and collusivity with China, which is par for the course, right? Uh, so these are the things which you outlined. Uh, with this, sir, uh, I request uh, Brigadier Arun Saigal, sir, your views on the nature of threats which. Pakistan will pose to uh, India. Okay. Over to you, uh, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. It is always a pleasure to be on this show. Uh, I learned so much on this and share some thoughts. Uh, the fundamental perspective which I want to cover is that Pakistan is a country which is enmeshed in multiple crises, which we all talked about, economic, political, security, and social. Interestingly, the World Risk Report came out yesterday, which talks about Pakistan as a country with the highest exposure to conflict and disaster among 15 disaster-prone countries. It is number five in terms of conflict and number one in terms of disaster. The, the bottom line is Pakistan is an unstable state. Look at the geography of Pakistan. People talk about that India is living in a very, very sort of uh, uh, you know, a, a contested neighborhood. Our neighbors are angry with us. Look at Pakistan state. On the east, Pakistan has India. 75 years plus of enmity continuing. It's thought of strategic depth in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has become its main betting oil. It is exchanged missiles with Iran. And there is no love lost with the Iranians. In fact, we had the privilege of discussing Pakistan somewhat with the Iranian uh, diplomats. And their thing was said that Pakistan is an unstable country and it concerns them. See, so the problem which Pakistan faces is this. Its instability is resulting in erosion of development and a state of stability within Pakistan. It is facing identity crisis and a dominant military with a fragile political system. So what this basically means is that the Pakistani state cannot handle its internal situation, which is becoming from bad to worse. So what is happening? At one level, there is an insurgency-like situation in northwestern front of province and Balochistan. Pakistan is internally in trouble, in turmoil. Secondly, the Pakistani military, through its attempt to control dissent amongst the middle cadres, dissent with Hamid's uh, court martial is indicative of the fact that there are elements within Pakistani military who will not bow down to the to the uh, dictates of the Asim Mundir. So the result basically is is that the Pakistani state is trying to, Pakistani military is in conflict with its own military cadres and is not very sure how to bring them under some degree of control or to bring them at least in their line of thinking. You saw what happened day before yesterday at the rally in uh, Karachi, or sorry, in Islamabad. Large scale violence took place. The attempt again over there was to use force 
to contain students and the PDI supporters. Now, all this leads to one simple fact. A simple fact is that the Pakistani state is unable to control dissent within and therefore the Pakistani military is trying to play the role of, of a political Democrat who's trying to bring about some kind of a stability is not happening purely because at one level the PLMLN and other partners, PPP, etc., do not under any circumstance want the voice of the people, which is the PTI at this point in time, to come into the front space. The army, having seen what happened on 9th May, having seen what is the descent within the lower cadres. So within the ex-servicemen that is taking place is very chary of making a deal. So internally, Pakistan is in turmoil. That's an important issue that we need to understand economically, politically, militarily. Now, the there is taking a cue from what Bangladesh has happened in Bangladesh. There is a scenario which could build up if situation is not controlled of a large scale street violence which might impact the uh, might affect or they might attempt to overthrow the sharif government now if that happens the problem will be how does the army play the role so if the army is going to play the role to of of containing and use large scale violence that is going to have a bigger issue so implosion in Pakistan is a serious problem for us, even much more than what we see in terms of cross-border terror, which I'll just come to in a while. So this is a major, major issue. In this scenario, sadly speaking, neither my good friends Americans who have a soft corner for the Pakistanis for multiple reasons, including the nuclear issues, including the fact that there is a certain degree of, of, of you know, old uh, partnerships, the, the kind of access the, uh, the Americans have uh, into the Pakistani system. And from there, they, they, they sort of uh, oversee the role of the ISS and Taliban and other elements, and they have their surveillance devices, etc., all located over there. And also my good friend Chinese, who looking at Pakistan, as an access to the warm waters of the Indian Ocean region. The development in Pakistan is basically infrastructure-oriented development. But the fact of the matter is, all these issues will go for a six if there is an internal implosion. And my biggest worry is that kind of an internal implosion is well on the cards. Now, the second element is that as has been brought out by the two esteemed speakers earlier, that whenever Pakistan faces an internal problem, it externalizes it. It has got only one area to externalize, that is in India. And that we are seeing now. now is the interesting statement was made on the Pakistani Defense Day by the Pakistani Army Chief, who mm -hmm. said that Kashmir is an important issue. Kashmir is, an, is, is, a, is a contested issue. We are. We will support the people of Kashmir, etc., etc. Standard line, and and basically speaking, is that Kashmir remains at the central focus point of the agenda. Now, the the question that arises is this: is that we are going through elections in Kashmir. So far, luckily, the pre-election violence has been contained. Although Pakistan has done its best to to raise the bogey of terrorism and and try to escalate and start fires in the Doda and Jammu areas, where, sadly speaking, we were caught flat-footed for the number of reasons which people are aware of, I'm not going to go into. But the fact of the matter is this, is that terrorism will continue to be used as a policy of last resort to take the focus from internal troubles to externalize uh, its security and bringing India into the center scope. But so that's the only thing that they believe it works. My understanding is, while the Pakistan leadership continues to believe that this is what they can do and this is what they must do, the reality is 
that the PTI, the other uh, other political elements, and the students and the younger generation in Pakistan, who otherwise are very bright, they 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 look at their future being thwarted by this ulterior motives of the Pakistani military and political establishment are not so sanguine about this this policy of 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 escalation of threat to India. But that, unfortunately, is something which is beyond their control because the military continues to believe they have this ham-handed view. And right through our history, you have seen that Pakistani military has been operationally reasonably good, but strategically a failure of institution. So this brings me to the point is that what are kind of threats that we can face? Fundamentally, I look at four types of threats, non-conventional. We see the presence of organized entities in ungoverned regions like Kutch area of Sindh Delta, tribal areas of Balochistan and Khyber Rukhukan, undermining the governing control. They are expanding their operational areas in the maritime space. This is not a direct threat, but it is a threat which is which is seriously undermining the internal stability of Pakistan. Next is the Jammu and Kashmir. Standard operating procedures, Great trouble in Kashmir, huge elements in Kashmir. There are enough number of people who in Kashmir who feels dissatisfied with the governance. In fact, you can never, you know, they are like uh, what we are seeing in the Bangladesh. No matter what much you do, no matter how much you look out for them, no matter how much development that takes place, they will always will be anti-India for reasons of their own self and nothing to do with the people and the, and, and the, and the growth and the development in Kashmir. So those elements will also be, uh, uh, be will be energized by Pakistan. The anti-terrorist measures in inflaming local passions are another area which they are, they 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 will, which will be employed by Pakistani state. The important point to note is that 230 million Pakistanis are struggling with poverty, as much as 40 percent of the population lives below the poverty line and has a 60% uh, literacy rate. This democratic opportunity and a youth bulge, which could have been utilized for national development, is equally becoming a calamity. Long time back, in one of the exercises I did with uh, net assessment exercise we did, we learned that youthful population can be a big assets if utilized properly, but it can also be a scourge because they become otherwise Vikings destroying the fabric of the nation. The instability is causing socio-economic decline. We have talked about it. But the point at which we have to understand is that there is another social risk of this. The lack of economic support, lack of social support is creating what I call a health risk in the country. And with the kind of floods that have taken place, Pakistan is at a great risk of in having in being inflicted by infectious diseases such as polio and pandemics. And this is something which we need to be concerned about because the the unfortunately these uh, things do not have a border, so they can easily get across India. And, uh, and and more importantly is that if such things happen and this in Pakistan becomes illivable we could see a large amount of massive migrations from Pakistan, like we saw in 1971 from Bangladesh. Uh, the subconventional conflict has already been covered. I will not talk much about it. Cross-border response, etc., has been there. But what is important is that there is a disconnect that is taking place. Earlier, the Taliban and the TTP were being used as, as weapons of terror against India. Now these things are not available. Now the home ground terrorists like Lashkare, Jashe Muhammad and some elements of that are being utilized. And they are being interspersed with ex-servicemen who have been brought into this whole game and are being shoved across the border to create the kind of mahim that we saw in Jammu Roda area. The 
sad part is that these elements have are virulent and they 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 carry out their attacks with a great degree of impunity and causing a huge amount of loss of life but the good part is that the larger terrorist organizations like isis ttp taliban etc are not supporting pakistan in this so to that extent this is something of interest to us that when we when we talk about terrorism in pakistan we need to be worried about concerned about that then the issue of conventional threat what worries me is the presence of factions within the military can give rise to a false flag operations undermining diplomatic efforts and increasing the risk of miscalculation now flag fast false flag operations is something which the pakistanis have talked about increasingly and we need to be concerned about the second issue we talked about is the sino pak collaboration reports indicate that there is going increasing number of an understanding of how do we manage both the borders and one element of that was that when we pulled out certain number of forces as a part of our readjustments uh, both in ladakh and around in the line of actual control sorry line of control the infiltration suddenly increased in rajouri area and this also uh, was coincided with a certain degree of assertive moves in ladakh so the element of pak china collaboration is real it can be calibrated this is something i want people to understand this can be calibrated at will and escalated up to a point where they believe that india's response levels will get constrained this is something which we need to worry about the next element is that the pakistani military continues to modernize as per sipri database pakistan has made 90 significant acquisitions of advanced weapon systems in the past 5 years in terms of pakistani strategy vis-a-vis -vis india in my last meeting on the trap to the pakistan represented a paper on on terms of the nature of threats and challenges to pakistan one of the elements of the paper was that pakistan is very clear that given the growing military imbalance at some stage in operational uh, contest they will have no option but to fall back on what is now being called as non strategic nuclear weapons or te tactical nuclear weapons as we call them their perception is that transition from conventional use to non strategic nuclear weapons use which is also form falls within the conventional framework as has been discussed in the nato uh, thinking as also in the russian thinking in the ukraine conflict is a par for the course and therefore does not constitute a need high level of escalation now this is something which we need to be concerned about and need to worry about because uh, it's the how we manage our our nuclear doctrinal thinking how do we manage our response this thing will need to require a much more nuanced understanding by simple other other than simply saying that a lot of our our analysts in delhi and other places continue to believe that oh we have a no first use doctrine and followed by massive response what does massive response mean etc is something which we need to be looking at so so in short what i'm trying to get at is that the pakistani state is in in the state of internal implosion the internal implosion has a huge amount of internal contradictions and the, and the sad part of this is that any implication of those internal contradictions will be post is by india and i also see that the army we thought that they have things under control is under huge degree of stress mr asim munir is not fully in control and i feel that and and this is my my personal uh, view is that the pakistan 
can create a scenario of escalation with India. Well, in the belief that any escalation with India will a divert attention, would help Pakistan, and consequences of that escalation could be managed by Pakistani China combined in this region. Thank you. I'll stop here and wait for your comments, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, you highlighted the multiple crisis which is ongoing in Pakistan. Actually, you reiterated what I've said. It's a very highly unstable state. Um, and the army, which is supposed to be holding Pakistan together, is, in a, is facing an identity crisis and is also having internal strife. Right? As a result, plus you look at the economy, the way it's going and other things which you outlined, you spoke of an implosion in Pakistan of the kind which is happening in Bangladesh, which could happen. And if that happens, we are going to face a major issue, right? If that happens, there are good chances which Pakistan might externalize the whole story. And in that, Kashmir would be their central focus or probably the reason by which they will start their escalation. And we have to be conscious of the fact and all this, uh, the... China park pollution will not go away anywhere. In fact, it gets reinforced. You also indicated that the recent escalation in uh, Rajori, you know, Jammu sector is part of the Sino park pollution, which I think is a very important factor uh, we should be clear of. And you spoke of four, four layers of threat, which can still come from uh, Pakistan. Uh, a subconventional threat, uh, JNK centered, maybe, right, through their internal terrorist organizations or rump organizations with ex servicemen. Uh, we could have a health related risk if the internal conditions in Pakistan deteriorate. Then you can have the conventional threat. I'm glad you brought out the conventional threat because. A lot of us think that the conventional threat has gone away. It, I'm sure it has not gone away. And I'll just show a few slides which I had with me. As you kept speaking, I caught hold of them. I'll show them to tell you where they are in terms of conventional strength in Army, Navy, and Air Force and their missiles. And of course, uh, all this with the sino uh, collaboration. Uh, and you also mentioned the park military acquisitions. And of course, last but not the least, it is their belief that they cannot handle uh, resurgent India. And hence, at any point of time, they can go in for the nuclear option. Uh, before I take on questions and all that, I'd like to go through this uh, thing, sir, with your right. I'll. OK, this is not coming through. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's come all right. No, it's come all right. But, no, no, this is the the, uh, the tables which I had are not coming through. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll just give me a minute. I'll show you another uh, slide in which I have all these. You have to give me half a minute, sir. So it's just loading up. Uh, no I just want to ask uh, Brigadier Cycle one question while you're locating your slide. Yeah, yeah, please, sir. For the audience. Sir, you mentioned this uh, thing which is a factor of the health risk to India from Pakistan. You know, that's something that we, uh, I don't think our military minds have uh, factored that in. And how do you uh, propose that we uh, should be able to counter it? Because if Polio campaigns, as you know, uh, some of them are not very successful in Pakistan. And this kind of virus spreading across, uh, a virus recognizes no borders. We saw that with COVID-19. How do you propose that uh, we get our act together and, and stop this? Uh, 
my view is that we have to undertake very serious immunization processes and procedures particularly in a in a border population and you can't just leave it to you know chalta hai kind of our health organization have to get their act together in in kashmir in jammu in punjab in rajasthan they have to get their act together because this is something uh, virus and say uh, yes yeah. and also we are also aware of the fact that the mpox Uh, cases are coming up in pakistan sure. come sure. up to india yes. so you know uh, so uh, while we only look at at the uh, we did a uh, uh, one scenario exercise uh, in terms of um, not nuclear terror but uh, cbr and terror cbr so, uh, right. so you do not have to launch physical offensive against countries you can use chemical and biological weapons particularly if 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 we were to if pakistan or some other element was to uh, you know uh, make our waters uh, dirty through chemical uh, agents and push chemical agents in our water systems it can have a devastating effect so we we need to and we also have to worry about the rdds remotely deployed devices this is uh, a small level nuclear uh, weapons which are which are dirty weapons yeah dirty, dirty weapons so you know there are there are a lot of these issues uh, we have to take care of and and particularly when we uh, at casa you know serious think tanks like casa look at these things we have to start looking at elements beyond what is beyond that and try and see all elements of success i i'll tomorrow i'll share with you my two papers on this cbr and threats yeah. which you just share you. with uh, okay thank you yes uh, right. tanushka please yeah yeah you know so uh, you, you look at this slide and it tells you the uh, imports of pakistan from 2000 to 2023 if you look at it uh, over a period of time you see a steep increase in imports from china and today the turkey is appearing as a major supplier of uh, um, you know this whole uh, arms to pakistan and you see the reliance on usa has gone down in fact over the past 5 6 years it's almost zero which is mm-hmm. right the next if you see service wise the the summary this is the air force you see the main aircraft which are there you know which uh, they have and you see the reliance on china so china gives mm-hmm. virtually uh, you know 45% of uh, you know the weaponry <coughs> legacy platforms are from usa i mean uh, or from france but modern attack systems are all from china right and it's not as if if you have a look at it it's not as if they are uh, uh, army which is in trouble <coughs> okay and i'll explain this a little later you look at the navy they are looking again you see it's a china dominated navy with a fair lot of things and these submarines this eight hangor class submarines uh, and the zulfikar class frigates are all chinese which are coming in new so they are expanding their navy now if they are expanding their navy we must be very clear that the threat from pakistan whether it's stable or unstable is beyond the normal land borders we are looking at they are looking at a con, you know with godar coming in in a big way they are looking at a base a major base in godar along you look at it along with the base at jibuti in times to come and i don't think that time is very far away maybe 3 4 5 years you are looking at a, a a considerable capability to control the western you know northern Arab, uh, arabian sea and which means that your western front has part continental and part maritime content which i don't think our uh, people are alive to if they are alive well and good but i don't think it is so and then of course the army again you see the kind of uh, you know the armor al zara type 15 al khalid these are all chinese weapon systems same for artillery artillery their sh 15 or for that matter the a100 mlrs they are all uh, chinese so they have got a whole lot of chinese stuff 
and the american stuff is almost out of their equation it's only legacy systems and the park missiles this is there this comes out straight out of the csis uh, you know website you get it and it's quite considerable so for us to think in india that the park conventional threat is not existent um, is to some extent living like an ostrich we must be cognizant of the stretch it might not be uh, you know offensive in nature it might not have great capability because sustenance we know is a problem but we cannot rule out a collaborative threat with in conjunction with china and in today's kind of warfare i think even if they catch a rock or high point or anything is good enough to commit outsized forces and get into a stage of escalation as we saw with our own experience with the uh, chinese at doklam and eastern ladakh so the the paradigm of warfare has changed it's no more going to be great offensives right it might be just sharp short exchanges in which the overall stamina of the country doesn't come into being and if this is combined with a nuclear option and subconventional mm. option we are looking at something different which we have to really factor in this is the point which i thought i'll i'll put across and of course uh, the fact of uh, pakistan army uh, you know everyone says that pakistan army is going to i mean like the army dragon also just said it's going to collapse if there's internal strife i agree to all that let me give a contrarian view sir because i i'm just giving a contrarian view you look at it who's the biggest land owner and real estate owner in pakistan it is bha and the pakistan army right who is the biggest construction agent or you know of infrastructure it is fwo pakistan army right who takes all the contracts government contracts 80% 70 to 80% of the government contracts in a single bidder mode it is the fauji foundation and the baria foundation and all these right given that the military businesses this has been analyzed to say that they give the give pakistan army political clout also economic clout and stability and that's one of the reasons why while there is internal strife within the army it might be to some extent only and they're able to cull people out because the look which is available to them is so strong the, you know the magnetism of the money which is available to them is so strong that no one falls out of line in in pakistan a combination of all this gives pakistan uh, like i said international clout and also great clout over the entire state and it is my belief that pakistan uh, pakistan cannot be pakistan army cannot be defeated militarily it has to be defeated politically if you see the history of the uh, pakistan army right with every defeat it has come back stronger and today pakistan is a broken up state but the army is the strongest right and unless you defeat it politically you will go no we'll go nowhere and this is something i think this threat is something which we have to uh, factor in our thinking yes sir yes no oh, i i i look uh... what you say is highly i mean absolutely i have got no quarrel with that i i i respect what you say that's conventional wisdom but what is bothering people like me is you cannot put faz hamid you can't put joc four core you can't put large number of officers you can't have large number of uh, ex servicemen who are being highly antagonized see uh, so so what are happening in pakistan pakistan is like a normal indian state i mean the mindset is basically we think the same yeah yes 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 that there is a perception that asim munir have gone much beyond mm, his yes. level and he is antagonizing the co commanders and other elements they were till yesterday were used to take the insults because of the hugely hierarchical uh, command and control system and they would buy that what i am trying to say is that we need to start looking inside pakistani military and and their 
veterans to try and understand are there any alternative dynamics at play which which a give us an understanding that all is not well with the pakistani military because every every leader sir every leader even xi jinping sitting like you rightly keep pointing out all the time is that he is a vulnerable man you say so yeah. no so because yes, but fact of the matter is that he has has he has removed all restrictions on everything and yet he and he is as a leader is feeling himself to be a challenge Asim Munir is the for the first time his language, the way he has handled people, the the high handedness, lack of sophistication, his anger to the his other brother co commanders, is indicating to us that there is a friction in the military. I totally buy that that friction is at surface level most of the time, like we understand from our watches, but our army. Our army thinking and the Pakistani army thinking is different. Can there be? Uh, we saw that happening during Musharraf's time. That engineer officer took over the army, and then Musharraf came, yeah. landed, and moved him. So similar kind of things can happen in Pakistan. All I am trying to say is that when we look at threat from Pakistan, we should start looking very closely inside the Pakistani military and try and understand the dynamic of it. Simple point, all that. Otherwise, I accept what you say. No, no, I agree with you, sir. On that score, there is absolutely no two ways about it. What is whatever is happening in Pakistan is quite unnatural, and this, in fact, I would put it this way: it is not only the way Asim Munir is dealing with his his uh, compatriots at the core commander level, the way he is dealing with the political class also is yeah. a little too yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that both these put together put Pakistan on the edge of a precipice. I have no doubt about it, and I go with you completely. It was just that I was trying to get Nawaz Sharif. Nawaz Sharif talk about anything in the last three months here. I just want to ask this question. He is the tallest leader of Pakistan today, and he's and he's muted. Muted, completely. yes. Yeah. In, in, uh, in, Mahmoudi, sir. sir, in fact, uh, General Shankar, uh, you recollect we had a very fascinating discussion on this very channel on uh, about mutinies is there a possibility of a mutiny in the pakistan army and we have seen what has happened how a number of officers senior officers have been eased out court martials have been ordered a number of junior officers are absolutely been gagged people who have seen even remotely close or remotely supportive of uh, of imran khan have all been moved out uh, no longer in uniform. Now people are seething with rage. Of course, I mean, and many people are quiet because it's after all their job. They've got wife and uh, you know children going to school. You can't afford to be thrown out uh, just for your political beliefs. But that is happening. And Brigadier Segal has very uh, clearly brought out. You see, he is antagonizing even the core commanders today. Yes. If, if you if you're following uh, Twitter and a couple of other Pakistani blogs, uh, this is coming out. But how does this manifest as a threat? I mean, we have digressed a bit. But no, that's okay, the sir. nature of threat, as we have discussed, as Brigadier Seigel and I have, and you, have, three of us have said, any instability within Pakistan will manifest itself against a threat against India. Because that is the only thing that can unite them. And, you know, paper yeah. over the differences. It will not... Uh, bridge the differences, we'll just paper over the differences for that short period. So they will look right. for a short bailout. Okay, over to you, please. Right. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, if you've not had anything more to say, I'll take some questions because I think yes, this subject we've covered from a 360 degree viewpoint. Uh, we've given two, three viewpoints to this whole problem. And, you know, and we must understand that where we are vis a vis Pakistan. It's all not just that Pakistan is going to go tomorrow into oblivion. It's there. 250 million Pakistanis will not go anywhere. And 250 million Pakistanis who are sick without water and food are a bigger problem. And that too, governed by an army which is imploding, is a major problem next to us. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I think we've run out of time. Uh, uh, I must thank both of you for having come here and given your views so lucidly. 
and painted a picture which is you know contrary to the normal thinking the normal thinking as we understand that pakistan is you know done and dusted is not there it is still alive it is still 230 million people it is still a strong army right and it is well funded because funding into the pakistan army uh, is not dependent on the budget that's why i stressed on the uh, you know the military businesses because the military businesses takes care of their other issues to leave the just the funding from the uh, budget to go into acquisitions and maintenance and now they've started making money out of selling ammunition so yes. let's not underestimate the pakistan army and it has got china's backing also uh uh uh, so last point anything you would like to say sir or uh, bigger cycle sir after that thank you sir thank you very much sir it's been an enjoyable evening it's enjoy the conversation sir thank you thank you gautam thank you sir. please yeah. please close the show i think we've had a very animated uh, discussion a uh, quite a free willing discussion uh, we have covered uh, practically all the aspects including some new aspects of threats that can emanate from an unstable pakistan um, i personally stand benefited listening to both you and brigadier segal and uh, thank you all very much thank your viewers for your patience and for participating in this kasa and gana shots webinar thank you brigadier segal sir and thank you general shankar i am honored to be a been part of this thank you sir jai, jai, thank jai you sir good evening jai and jai hind good evening and jai hind jai hind jai hind